Welcome back to Face the Nation. For a closer look at some of the major issues we're facing abroad, we turn to Corey Shockey, who is a distinguished fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Her new book is Safe Passage, the transition from British to American hegemony. Michael O'Hanlon, a senior fellow and director of research at the Brookings Institution, is here, and he, of course, is in Washington. Corey, let me start with you. I tried to get the UN ambassador to give me a sense of why now on Jerusalem. Um, why now? <laughs> Uh, it's not clear why now. Uh, I think the White House is hoping that it will push the peace process forward by, as Nikki Haley said, taking Jerusalem off the table. I think that's unlikely to prove true. Uh, I think it's going to make the peace process a lot more complicated because it doesn't look like they, uh, it doesn't look like they had anything to offer Palestinians. Right. And so it's surprising that other countries in the region care less, in part because they need more cooperation from Israel now than before. Michael, what's your view? People see this violence. What, how should they see this? Big deal? Should they be nervous? What's your sense? Well, I'm glad to, you asked it that way, John, because I think it's, it's a medium deal. It's not the end of the world. President Trump didn't say that that East Jerusalem could never be the capital for Palestine. He didn't make any other such uh, declarations that were really out of what we all expect in any kind of a final peace agreement anyway. And of course, the peace process, even though Corey's totally right that it's, it, this is not helpful for the peace process, it wasn't exactly going any place anyway. So I think there are bigger questions about what kind of leverage can we create with both parties. And perhaps we need to think harder about that. But I don't see this as more than what my colleague Natan Sachs calls an unforced error. In other words, it's not a tragedy. Right. It's probably a mistake. It probably complicates the atmosphere. I'm not sure it really changes the terms of any potential peace deal or really impedes any negotiation that was having any momentum to begin with. Let's talk now to, about a place where an unforced error could lead to a tragedy, which is North Korea. Corey, where are, what's happening right now? Americans here, um, you know, it's it, it perilous, and then it kind of the issue goes away, and then it becomes perilous again. How should people think about this? Well, I I am more concerned about it now. I I think what I hear out of the White House parallels pretty closely what the Bush administration sounded like in 2003 in the run-up to the Iraq War, that the leadership of North Korea is fundamentally erratic and untrustworthy, that retaliation is inadequate as a strategy. And I think they're not thinking through quite carefully enough, for example, what Asia will look like geopolitically if the United States engages in a preventative war that the Australians Japanese and South Koreans don't want and might not participate in. Michael, uh, Corey raises 2003. This president has said that the lead up to the Iraq war and the war itself was the greatest blunder in American mm. history. So parallels to that, uh, that should make people nervous. And this would probably be a hundred times more lethal for allied forces than the Iraq war. We have to keep that in mind. Let's say the North Koreans can only detonate one or two nuclear weapons, but they're over Seoul. Then we have, we have up to a couple hundred thousand Americans in Seoul. Leave aside the issue of whether the families of American servicemen should come home. There are a lot of American civilians who just live there doing business. So if we were to have a war in Korea, the estimates are that one nuclear explosion over that densely populated city could kill about two or three times as many people as the Hiroshima or Nagasaki bomb. And that's for one explosion. So anything that leads us towards a higher probability of nuclear war, I think, is, is probably a huge mistake. But there is, I don't want to be too scary, there is one potential interpretation of what's going on that's a little more hopeful, which is that the Trump administration really doesn't have particular interest at the end of the day in launching a preventive war, but by creating the sense that they are impatient, they're trying to persuade China to turn the economic screws more forcefully and try to get us in a better bargaining position. I'm not comfortable with this situation because I don't know if, if what I just said is true. And if the alternative interpretation is true, then we could be in for a horrible war, the worst since World War II. Moreover, the administration is painting themselves into a corner with the rhetoric, even if it is just intended to make the Chinese more cooperative. They have actually, they're saying that the sand is slipping through the hourglass and we might have to act soon and the military option is the only option if this doesn't work. And that actually, I think, not only creates a red line, it attaches a ticking clock to it. If I could add, the, the question too, I agree 100% with Corey, the question is what are the military options under consideration? All out preventive war is, of course, the extreme. 
There's also one idea that Ash Carter and Bill Perry, two former secretaries of defense of the Democratic Party, wrote about 10 years ago. They're not necessarily articulating it now, but uh, 11 years ago, they, they suggested that we shoot down a North Korean ICBM launch uh, before it either gets off the launch pad or before it gets out of the atmosphere, and just deny North Korea the ability to really learn more about its missile programs. That's the kind of a, that's a very dangerous idea, yeah. too, because you don't know what North Korea is going to do in response. But that's the sort of idea that may be in play here. Let me step back here for a second and ask you all both a question about the larger buildup of, of forces. There is in the Congress a request for even more money than the president has asked for for his defense budget. Corey, what do you think will happen with that? And uh, do we need all this money? I'm skeptical that the Congress is actually going to pass an, appro an appropriations bill that will give the Defense Department the $700 billion that authorizers in Congress have asked for. It looks to me much more likely that we will see a series of continuing resolutions. We're already a third of the way into the fiscal year. So I'm really skeptical, both because of the way the president's budget teed this up. So, so Congress is going to be adding $100 billion over uh, what the president requested. But I'm also skeptical that they can get deals on the other things, like DACA, like uh, the spending uh, distinction between domestic and, and national security. It looks to me like this is likely to drag on, and that's actually terrible for the Defense Department. Mm -hmm. Continuing resolutions uh, prevent them starting new programs. It prevents the managerial latitude that DOD needs to use the money well. So rather than add more money, I would instead give DOD the latitude to do a, a lot more programmatic management. I think that would help them a lot more. Michael, your thought? Amen. I mean, we're at a point here in December, two and a half months into the new fiscal year, we don't know if the defense budget is going to be $600 billion for this year or $700 billion. That's a huge gap, and that's roughly the range of play. And Donald Trump is sort of in between uh, in his request. I'm sort of in between myself. The Congress under Senator McCain and Congressman uh, Thornberry and others has, have proposed the $700 billion. Anything north of $600 billion exceeds the Cold War average when you adjust for inflation. I do think we need a bit more money. But I think what we need really is clarity and a decision because you can't do proper training, maintenance, you can't enter into long-term contracts. You can't just do good custodianship of the Department of Defense when you're this far into the year and you don't know what your budget will be. All right, that's it for the both of you. Thank you so much. And we'll be right back to discuss the political news of the week with our political panel. And we turn now to our political panel. Molly Ball is national political correspondent for Time magazine. Their person of the year was the Silence Breakers and the Me Too movement. Lonnie Chen is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and a policy advisor to uh, the Romney and Rubio presidential campaigns. We're also joined by CBS News White House and senior foreign affairs correspondent Margaret Brennan and Ed O'Keefe, who covers Capitol Hill for The Washington Post and is a CBS News contributor. Margaret, I want to start with you on this question of Jerusalem. Um, what do you make of this decision and the timing of it? Well, this appears to have been a significant foreign policy and national security decision made primarily for domestic political reasons by the President of the United States. He succeeded in touching probably the most sensitive nerve nerve in one of the most intractable conflicts in history. Um, and this is going to make for a complicated visit for Vice President Pence, who has to head to Israel and to Egypt uh, within just a week or so. Uh, but what the President uh, appears to be doing here, it's interesting, with all due respect to the UN Ambassador who was talking to you about making this decision. It doesn't do the things she said. It doesn't actually move the embassy. In fact, the president on camera signed a waiver keeping the embassy in Tel Aviv. Uh, and it doesn't, for the moment, decide the fate of Jerusalem. If you listen to the president's national security team, who says, actually, we're still up for negotiation on the final status. In fact, if you ask U.S. diplomats where the city of Jerusalem is located, they still won't tell you it's located in Israel. They'll just tell you it's the political capital. So it appears to be the kind of sleight of hand that allows the president to say he achieved a campaign uh, objective, much like the Iran deal, without necessarily changing things, because any new embassy is going to take four years or more to build. All right. Let's uh, now move back to domestic issues. Um, Molly, let's go to, to Alabama here. we got a Senate race going to come to its conclusion next week. Where do you think things stand in this race? 
I do not think we know how this is going to turn out. There has seemed to be a shift in the conventional wisdom uh, toward Roy Moore. You hear a lot of predictions that he is going to prevail having, uh, because the beginning of the accusations against him uh, has now, is now several weeks in the rearview mirror and has and a lot of Alabamians have, have had chance to sort of process that. Uh, but we have still seen polls that are quite equivocal, uh, especially in such a red state. That's pretty remarkable. And uh, what I have heard from my sources on the ground, and I'll be in Alabama in a, just a few hours, <laughs> uh, is that voters are pretty powerfully conflicted. You know, these are voters who generally want to favor the Republican, all other things being equal. Uh, but you have to remember that Roy Moore, even among Republicans, is, an, is a very polarizing figure. There's a lot of Alabamians uh, who see him as an embarrassment to the state uh, or just as not the, the, the sort of person, particularly considering these charges, that they want representing them. So whether that is enough to put a Democrat over the top in a state like Alabama, it's very difficult to tell. Lonnie, let me ask you about the reaction to the RNC supporting Roy Moore this week, the president supporting Roy Moore. There were, there was some talk about and coverage and Republicans saying, I'm, I'm through with the party because they're supporting him. Now that can get over torqued in today's media environment. So it's hard to know what the level of, of real um, dis, uh, outrage. I mean, obviously Ben Sass said what he said, Senator Collins thought was disappointed too. What's your sense of how big a deal this is outside of Alabama for the for the Republican Party where it is right now? Uh, I, I think that it is a developing big deal, if that makes sense. As we go into 2018, this is not the last time we're going to see some version of this movie. In other words, I think you're going to continue to see this conflict between different parts of the Republican Party. And yes, it's played out in Alabama in a really concerning fashion. A guy like Roy Moore, clearly very flawed and very problematic. But you're going to have contested primaries potentially in states like Arizona, maybe even Nevada of next year. So th this battlefield is just being uh, played out right now. People are just kind of stepping onto this battlefield. So I think to the extent that we're seeing this in Alabama now, what we're seeing is a microcosm of the kinds of battles we're going to see through 2018. And for Republicans like myself, it's very concerning because what you're seeing is a fundamental split and fracture in the party uh, that we've known has existed for some time, but now is being played out in a very public way and being played out in elections that really do matter and have policy consequences for the last two years of President Trump's administration, at least for his first term. Well, and Ed, and that was the, it was the policy implications President Trump was uh, arguing for, basically saying, whatever you uh, may believe, I want a Republican in that seat. It worked for him, because remember, in the last few weeks of the presidential campaign, he was running around the country saying to Republicans, you may not like me, but I'm going to appoint conservative Supreme Court justices and other conservatives to the court. And it worked. One in five voters showed up, and the exit poll showed the Supreme Court was their top concern. Moore's making the same exact argument, and that may, in fact, end up working for him. What I find interesting, and what will be very curious to track in the next few weeks, is if he wins, how quickly does that ethics investigation begin? How long does it end up taking? And what do they do if it brings forward information that suggests uh, conduct unbecoming of a senator? Susan Collins seemed to suggest today that would be a difficult, uh, you know, uh, thing to do, to expel him. Uh, but the fact that there could be a secretive ethics investigation underway will just hang over the Republican Party on Capitol Hill over the course of most of the year, most likely. And, you know, I, even talking to a colleague who takes photographs up at the Capitol, he says, I suspect most people are even going to avoid getting in the elevator with him because they just don't, don't want to be associated with him at all. And those are the related to the allegations that he denies in right. terms of sexual misconduct. He doesn't deny having said that homosexual activity should be illegal. He doesn't deny having said that Muslims shouldn't be allowed to serve in the United States Congress. So there are things that are being set up here that not only highlight the divisions you talked about within the Republican Party, some would say the fight for the soul and the identity, but also position the Democrats here. And that's what was so interesting with the Al Franken uh, resignation uh, to come, was that the Democrats seem to be positioning themselves ag around that identity of this is what we are not. We are not going to play those cultural I want to get to the Frank and, and, as you say, resignation to come. We still don't know what the end date on that is. But, Lenny, I wanted to go back to something you said because Mitt Romney, who you used to work for, came out and um, basically took the moral position above all other Republicans, basically, and said um, there's no reason to support Roy Moore, and it's a stain on the party. Then Steve Bannon came back at him from the... What did you make of that back and forth? Is um, Does it have any lasting impact? And... What's, is Mitt Romney sort of emerging here as something in the Republican Party? Put a name on it. 
Well, it, you know, he's sort of the, the, the sensible conscience of the Republican Party in a lot of ways. I mean, look, the only reason anybody cares about what Steve Bannon has to say is to the extent that he, people think he's a proxy for the president. To the extent that people think that Steve Bannon's expressing a point of view that the president holds, then it's relevant. Otherwise, he's just a, a, a political pundit out there with another opinion. And the question really will be to what extent the president carries through this argument. Uh, if there is a Senate campaign to be had in Utah for Governor Romney, for, for example, to what extent is the president willing to go out there and prosecute some argument against Mitt Romney or try to find somebody to run against him? That's the only way it becomes relevant. Otherwise, uh, it's all just a bunch of blather as far as I'm concerned. Now, it's very concerning blather because obviously what Bannon said was completely beyond the pale, what Bannon said about Governor Romney. But I think Governor Romney is putting out there a point of view that, uh, that needs to be articulated in the Senate and in the Congress beyond the 2018 election cycle. Just so people aren't confused, uh, uh, Steve Bannon said that Governor Romney ducked service in Vietnam because he had a religious exemption. He went over, he was a missionary right. in France, which is a strange thing to say, given that his president, uh, Trump, had many, many deferments uh, from the Vietnam War. Let me, Molly, switch to you uh, here on the question of Al Franken. You wrote about him this week, and you said he really didn't want to leave the Senate. He really didn't seem to. I mean, if you saw the farewell speech that he gave, first of all, it took a lot of pressure to get him to resign. And what you saw was uh, more than half of the Democratic caucus had to come out publicly. It wasn't enough. You know, we knew that there was there was pressure from behind the scenes on Senator Franken, and he resisted that pressure. And that was why his colleagues were forced to come out publicly all the way up to the Democratic leader, Chuck Schumer. And then finally, uh, very grudgingly, uh, Franken got up there on the floor of the Senate and said he believed it was ironic that he was resigning given the allegations against President Trump and against Roy Moore. This is a sort of whataboutism argument of the kind that we sometimes hear Trump make, right? Why is it fair that you're that you're persecuting me? Look at what crooked Hillary did. It's the same kind of argument. And and not only did he not apologize for his alleged misconduct, he took he 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 took pains to clarify that he hadn't actually admitted to anything and 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 he cast doubt on some of his accusers. Uh, so but he did he did accede to this pressure. There there's a lot of uh, resentment and uh, and, and disagreement in Democratic circles about whether this was the right thing to do. A lot of Democrats talking about where they're setting the standard and, and, and whether it's fair. Minnesota Democrats, very sad to lose Franken. The National Party, sad to lose someone who's probably the biggest fundraising draw for Democratic Oops. candidates across the country. Uh, and so, and now you have a situation where, given that Minnesota was quite close in 2016, uh, whoever the governor appoints to fill this seat is going to have to run again in 2018, and that could possibly be a tough race. All right, we're going to pause that there. We'll be back in a moment with a little more on Al Franken plus taxes. Stay with us. And we're back with our political panel. Ed, uh, Senator Durbin said there was no political calculation in the Al, Moore, in the Al Franken decision. Do you buy that? No, not at all. <laughs> it was a total political calculation. We know that the week before he resigned, he was already facing pressure from his colleagues who were asked to hold off, and that the morning that the final allegations surfaced, they all got together by email and text and phone calls and said, this is it, we got to do this. The party wants to make, the Democrats, want to make a competency and professionalism argument in November, believing that that is the way they can take back the House and the Senate. They got to purge all these guys in order to do that, because you can't sit there and have alleged bad actors in your party if you're trying to suggest that you would run the government better. More broadly, um, I think viewers deserve to know this. Uh, it's no secret for those of us who cover Congress that we have all, in one way or another, been contacted by lawmakers or their aides in recent days, privately asking, what else do you have? Who's next? They are terrified of this storyline, and they know the consequences of it now could lead to much bigger problems for their party, maybe for a piece of legislation they're working on, maybe the chance of the party holding together through the elections. But members in both parties, aides in both parties, very concerned that more is to come. And look, I think it's safe to say more is to come. Mm -hmm. We don't know who exactly it will be about. It will be carefully reported. But it shows you that they are so scared now because they realize so quickly people are disappearing. And think yeah. about it. We saw a guy who served for more than 50 years kicked out. We saw the party's top fund, one of the party's top fundraisers kicked out. A social conservative warrior, Trent Franks, had to resign amid a lot of questions about his behavior. And, and, and we've never seen this kind of a purge, not since the Civil War. 
Margaret, I want to switch to taxes here because this is a big thing that's happening too and the president wants it signed by Christmas. What have you made of his salesmanship of the tax cut bill relative to um, health care? Because the tax cut bill, according to both the Quinnipiac poll this week and Gallup, has only 29% support in the country. This is a president whose key skill is as a marketer, but that's not very popular for that legislation. Well, he's marketing something that seems to be different than what is the, the product he's selling. Um, and the message from the president, even just on Twitter, he, his constant focus on the stock market, it appears to be that he sees stocks and corporate profits as uh, a proxy for the success of this bill and ultimately his end goal, even though on the campaign trail and when he goes out to sell this, he's talking about the benefit to the middle class and to the working class who, who help to support him. And it's not clear that these pieces at this point add up to a benefit for those people. Um, at this point, though, to, to say that this would be a boost to corporations, undoubtedly it would to take the corporate tax rate from 35 down to 20 percent. But you're not legislating how a corporation spends those profits, right? You're not necessarily forcing income growth. You're mm -hmm. not making that worker take home more pay as a result. You can't possibly force that. You also can't force broader employment. So this gamble of how this will ultimately pay off to the broader economic benefit of the country is something that the president seems to be focusing on, whether you call it trickle-down economics or something else. Lonnie, what did you make of Senator Rubio, who said uh, Republicans should go back and look at a 1977 speech by uh, President Reagan, or not President, then Governor uh, Reagan, where he said the Republican Party has to worry about having a country club big business image? Well, yeah, I, th I think there's a there's a point that he's making right now. Senator Rubio and Senator Lee uh, had an amendment to the tax bill that would have made the child tax credit fully refundable, which would have been a huge boon to lower middle class and lower uh, income families. And unfortunately, that was uh, voted down by the Senate. I, I think that point of view, though, suggests that what we're seeing in the tax bill now to Republicans, this is more of a feature and not a bug, right? That they're actually looking at lowering the corporate tax rate. This has been something Republicans, mainstream Republicans, have talked about now for years, if not decades. And so this is actually a relatively conventional tax bill. The difficulty in selling it, though, is how do you translate a corporate tax cut into what it means for the average middle class worker? There is a strong argument to be made that this tax bill is going to boost growth, which is going to boost wages, which is going to go into the pockets of middle class taxpayers. But that's not really the argument you're hearing. You're hearing this is a middle class tax cut. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of dissonance in the messaging that they're going to have to get straight. But I think that it won't uh, in in inhibit them from getting this bill through and to the president's desk uh, in a matter of weeks. Molly, 30 seconds. Do you agree? And also so do Democrats have any opportunity here to uh, to take advantage of this tax process? Well, if you believe the Democrats, uh, they are extremely excited about the political opportunity afforded by this tax bill. It is, as you mentioned, very similar to what happened with health care, where Republicans were sort of between a rock and a hard place. They wanted to keep a campaign promise, particularly to their own base, that Republican primary voters, who they told they were going to repeal Obamacare and reform the tax system. Uh, but the bill itself was broadly unpopular, and it really is not clear whether what was worse for them politically, passing the bill or not passing the bill, given how disliked it is. And so, uh, but what you do hear from Republicans is they feel they have to do this, A, because they think it's a good idea to cut taxes, uh, and also because their base will be so dispirited if they don't get anything done this first year. All right. Got to end it there. Thanks, Molly. We'll be right back.